Hello. Hi, morning. Can you hear me okay? I can. How about me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're very clear. I'm outside, so if the if the noise of the wind of the ocean gets too noisy, just let me know. I can head inside. <laughs> Sounds like a rough environment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing wonderfully, to be perfectly honest. I was uh, uh, rereading your uh, – well, it's not really an article as much as it is a book, but um, – <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's fantastic to uh, encounter it. Now, just thinking about all the different folks I had to send it to when you're ready for it. Oh, really? Yeah, I would very much appreciate that. I have been you know, speaking about the uh, the ambiguity that you just kind of alluded to with respect to the, the article versus book context. I have been wondering in terms of you know how how best to publish it, right? Like, would it be better split up into multiple articles or, or published yeah. as a long form? Wondering, I would... You know, I would I would, uh, I would, in a virtual form, I would break it up into probably four different articles. My senses, mm-hmm. maybe five, mm-hmm. uh, maybe three, but so four seems like feels right. Um, and Medium, of course, has that structurally. It's a really they they designed it so it's easy to do it that way. Yep. Um, and I've noticed that even like at a at a stylistic level, you've almost already coded that in, where mm-hmm. each section recapitulates things in a way that allows somebody to break off, come back a couple of days later, and just kind of refresh. Um, yeah. and then separately, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you got that feeling because I was hoping to do that given the, the relative complexity of the article, um, yeah. to try to kind of create a continuity amongst those ideas. I think it's one of those things where you, you kind of have to do something like that. So I'm glad it came through. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that actually myself when something I've been writing recently that you do, you know, for, as, as the writer, the concepts are very clear. So mm-hmm. it, it may feel a bit, from my perspective, it feels maybe a bit, um, repetitive. Mm-hmm. But I think for the for the reader, it's extremely useful to kind of have like a, almost like an A, B, C, A, mm-hmm. E, E, F, A, B, some kind of structure like that where you're laying something out and then you're coming back and returning to it in, in, in the new context that the reader has now built in their consciousness. To yep. build sort of more, it, it's, I guess it would be structurally identical to the evolutionary laying down of um, complex ecosystems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the idea of um, you know, building those coherent structures to some extent, not to get too meta and loop back on the concepts in the essay itself, but um, at least that's something that I noticed uh, you know, developing as, as just a human being in this world, trying to communicate with other human beings and realizing over time just how complex that can be when you're trying to communicate um, ideas that you think make complete sense in your own mind, given all of the latent knowledge and structure that you've carried with you implicitly, um, and yet does not necessarily exist in the vast majority of other minds, or may exist, but in some other form of translated or rotated or projected shapes that you need to discover and kind of pull out somehow. Um, and By the way, I just want to uh, uh, interrupt. That's a great metaphor. Like the, the, the topological language, mm-hmm. um, if somebody catches that metaphor, you're going to be grabbing a lot of territory precisely in doing map mapping. Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I have the language of projection and uh, transformation. And so mm-hmm. given the fact that I have that, that language, we can now begin using that, which is a very powerful language for doing this kind of exercise. Extremely powerful. And then that's why when I heard you speak, I think, so we met for the first time at the, um, what is it? Upgrading Democracy Conference about a year ago. Okay. Um, and I, you know, when when you were speaking, that was also when I first met uh, first met Brett Weinstein for the first time because he was there that day as well. Yeah. That was before the whole Evergreen controversy, and you got thrust onto the uh, onto the national or international stage. Yeah. Uh, which I think in the long term will be you know, obviously a net positive, given that his message is now finding a, a much larger forum. Yep. Yeah, I heard, I heard you speaking that day, and you know, I, I did hear you at least alluding to, if not explicitly using that. Um, that, that topological language. And that's been something that's been deeply ingrained into my own, um, my own thinking ever since I started toying with, you know, my background was in evolutionary psychology and behavioral economics in college, but I got really into agent-based modeling mm. and tinkering around those types of systems and understanding adaptive landscapes and, and playing with the variables to understand the different you know, modalities or phases of, of complex system dynamics and building up an intuition for that. And I think that that sort of laid this neural framework for how I thought about absolutely everything. And 
And from that, it seemed very obvious when I would try to communicate particular ideas. And then I came to realize that that framework of communication, just it's, it's not part of the, the general consciousness, right? It's not right. taught generally. It's not the way we tend to think about systems. And this is actually one of the topics that, you know, I don't know, we don't need to jump into it right now because there's some other things that might be more important to speak about. But I feel as if it's deeply related to the limits of statistical understanding um, as we as we tend to use statistics in popular communication. Um, there are particular abstractions and, and ways of, of communicating ideas that are hangovers from a more statistical as opposed to dynamical perspective. Um, I, I have no idea what you're talking about, so uh, therefore I'm very intrigued. Okay. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. I'm not sure if it's the, it's the most interesting, yeah. most important place to go, but... I don't um, think so either. Let me apply a heuristic, though. Um, I don't know how much effort it would take to explore that area, but given the fact that it is always best in the beginning of a relationship to build coherence, mm -hmm. we think about the fact that it just is intrinsically interesting and is an example of a place where there's a, a current lack of obvious coherence. Yep. It may actually heuristically be useful to basically put it out as a play space mm -hmm. to, plan to, uh, to collaborate together on learning how to just share how we can come to understand more effectively. Yeah. That is general purpose always useful and probably is in fact justifies going into it. <laughs> Although I may be rationalizing just the fact that I'm curious. <laughs> no, no, certainly, certainly. I mean, maybe I can just kind of try to reiterate and paraphrase it in a way that could give you a, a mental or cognitive placeholder that, yep. that might be a little bit more graspable than that first pass, which was not very clear. Um, I think the best way that I've heard it described succinctly was actually um, in, uh, which book was it? One of Young, Carl Jung's books in which he talks a little bit about, he gives a very simple example in terms of, um, you know, you have um, something like 100 marbles. And the average weight of a marble might be something like 8.3 grams, but you might very easily come to find out that no single marble is 8.3 grams, right? So there's this, there's an abstraction of truth, right? And that abstraction of truth has certain utility. It can be used for certain, uh, you can use as a tool for certain purposes in the world, uh, yep. more or less effectively, but there's still a space, there's still like an abstraction gap between the actual um, empirical or physical actuality of the system and the abstraction of the statistical understanding above that system. Okay. And, and what I was talking about before was that, you know, that the agent based intuition is far more of a bottom up intuition that, that kind of bubbles up from the dynamics of the system as opposed to trying to use statistical abstractions from the top down. Yeah. Understand completely. Perfect. Well done. Okay. Cool. So with that out of the way, um, let me know what you think of, I, I know you recently wrote something about Facebook. Uh, I'm currently, I, I have something that I wrote that will be published fairly soon in, in Quillette. Um, I think they are two slightly different perspectives, but I think they're, they could um, be, you know, they, they feed back on one another in a way that could be quite useful to discuss. Mm, okay. So perhaps maybe you could, um, you know, yours was from the, the perspective of uh, fiduciary responsibility of Facebook. So maybe you could just kind of elaborate your thought process on that. And then I could come in and, and kind of bounce off some of the ideas that I've been writing about. And sure. So the, the original motivation was actually taking a look at the evolving uh, landscape at a pretty high level. So mm -hmm. including, for example, things like Internet of Things. Yep. Um, and, uh, well, sensors in general. Mm -hmm. um, and the natural, the, the natural path that these particular technological capacities portend is a generalization of the three principles I put in my uh, article. Uh, so mm -hmm. The idea is that Facebook just happens to be an early example of what will show up as being a nearly uh, ubiquitous um, I'm actually just going to call it a domain, right? It's a, it's sure. a whole set, set of, of phenomena. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, the effort was to find something. So g given the fact that that's the case and given the fact that we just find ourselves in a sort of a strategically interesting location where a lot of attention is pointed at the problematic of Facebook, right? The canary mm -hmm. 
in the coal mine is coughing vigorously. Mm -hmm. um, an effort to find a way to, uh, there's about three things. Let me see if I can hold all three simultaneously. To meaningfully and simply and clearly convey a, a, a way of structuring a space for that entire domain that because it's actually already been, it's, it's a kind of a principle of biomimicry, mm -hmm. um, a, a way of structuring the space that has already been the subject of a very long evolutionary history with a variety of different early examples that actually show up in the same domain. Mm -hmm. um, so we get the advantage of not having to, to do sort of classic top-down design, but to be able to do something that, that my deep code group calls transcendental design which is something that utilizes both bottoms up and top down methodologies yep. in a uh, coherent space yep. to, to, to develop uh, those kinds of structures. Um, and so that then led to the proposition that the concept of fiduciary responsibility, which is as far as I can tell, at least 1200 years old um, and spans all of common law um, turns out to be, a way of creating a, well, instantiating a structure that already lives at a deep level of in, intuition a, across the entire collective intelligence of the legal, set of legal institutions that span all of Western civilization, uh, and by the way, also most of India, um, that is very, it's like a very precise way of selecting the right kinds of values that are responsive to the set of characteristics of the domain. Mm -hmm. um, and just to recapitulate, the characteristics of um, intimacy, ubiquity, and I called it AI, but it's actually just asymmetry. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the idea. Oh, sorry. And then, of course, by virtue of it being simple and present and intuitive, that hopefully it would also have a strategic ability to catch on the wave that exists right now and perhaps bring some level of increasing consciousness of both the nature of the problematic mm. and of the, well, and, and of what the right kinds of solutions should feel like, not even look like, but feel like. Um, did, did I talk to you about Joe Edelman stuff? Um, I don't think we've discussed it explicitly, although okay. I'm, I'm like familiar in passing with the work. Okay, so Joe, the, it, Joe was not involved in this conversation, but if you, if you tap into the primary move that he's making, it's completely aligned with the primary move that you're making, as far as I can tell, uh, and is also associated with this, which is to say, beginning to be build skill sets at the layer in the meaning-making stack, not the sense-making mm -hmm. stack, but the meaning-making stack yep. that is at the lowest level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, 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 that was the other try, sort of driving vector, which is to start to get people to become aware of their own uh, values complexes mm -hmm. and how those value complexes relate to each other and then show up and how they make sense, move from making sense of to making choices in, which is how yeah. I define meaning making in the world. Yeah. So that's the, that's the context. Yeah. yeah. Um, within a complex system, I kind of see those, you know, within that meaning making framework, kind of see them as uh, like the nucleation events in in the feed forward process of, uh, of, of instantiating structures that would, would then display your meaning or display values in society. Right. So, so you get, you get environmental stimuli based on, you know, you know, the way that, <laughs> the way that you perceive all of that stimuli is, is this extremely layered uh, response that occurs across, you know, the biological, the sociobiological, the cultural, uh, the technological layers at all of these different, um, I guess you might call frame rates of, of kind of iterative frame rates and they're all happening simultaneously. Um, and so when information comes in based on the, I guess what you might characterize as self-sovereign structures within the individual mind, um, you might grasp on to different facets of that information or those stimuli and uh, therefore uh, respond in, in a host of, of different ways based on, what you perceive to be the most relevant way to act in your environment. Yep. And, and when those types of patterns start cohering into something that, that gives you a response that is uh, perhaps desirable or may, um, you know, it might even not be desirable, it might be just addictive. Um, but, but that kind of starts 
threading into the idea of meaning as a pattern, right? It's something that you can actually grasp in a way that is, um, that is subjectively relevant to your desire to um, either consciously achieve a goal or um, act on behalf of one of the goals that larger structures may have for you um, and, and have embedded inside of you, right? Uh, without your conscious knowledge. Ooh, okay, so you actually grab three distinct domains simultaneously. Uh, and there's certain places where you, you actually like drop two into a concept and I saw it like uh, open, like, what was it? Um, the d- distinction between what is, what is good and what is addictive mm-hmm. is what happens when you move from the perception to the uh, through sense making into meaning making. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's, it's actually precisely in the gap between the feed forward and the feedback loop. So yep. you have a perceptual modality and a sense making set of heuristics that endeavor to close the binding between what is good and what is perceived as good. Mm-hmm. And of course, addiction lives in that gap, right? It, yes. it is that which is perceived but is not good um, at a maximal level. Um, so it's maximally perceived and minimally good uh, is max is is you know the essence of addiction. So that's like catching a, catching what happens as the feedback loops then starts to come back from adaptive reality. And so you have this in this sort of double double loop layer where you've got your internal subjective processes that are moving from these multi-layered, multi, multi-modal, differentially frame-rated um, perception, sense-making, meaning-making, choice-making, action-taking processes. Mm-hmm. And then you've got, which then in, in, in the sense-making to meaning-making, you're going to be making heuristic propositions around the degree to which the consequences that you're perceiving are themselves good. And then simultaneously, you have underneath the other half. So I think of it as a circle. On the mm-hmm. other half of the circle, you have actual complex reality, which is doing kind of the same thing, which is to say that your actions are now propagating out into reality, changing the, the context or the niche, mm-hmm. the environment in which you're in, and feeding back on you in ways that are propagating back up through that, that process, um, which will show up as, in fact, actually adaptive. Yes. Um, and then that's, that sphere is, is the total um, loop. And it's really interesting that if you actually recognize that you've got a subjective objective slice and mm-hmm. then you run a sphere throughout all of that and recognize that your sovereignty must contain that entire sphere, mm-hmm. but <coughs> your agency only lives in the top half of the sphere mm-hmm. um, and the intermediation between the subjective and the objective is, is the area of um, perceptual and agentic uh, relationship, then yeah. that, like, that's the model that I, that I work with. Okay, okay. I like the spherical idea. Um, I, so huh, at some point, if we meet up, I would like to actually show you some of the drawings that I made quite a while ago when I was trying to- you live in San Francisco? Me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna be coming up there. Apparently, uh, Vitalik and some of the other people at Ethereum requested that I come up and give them some, uh, some advice and mentorship. Okay. So I'll be coming up May- Maybe they could use that. <laughs> yes, I think they're, yes. They, they're definitely in need right now for sure. Um, <laughs> May 9th, and I'll probably be up for a little while, like maybe four or five days. Mm-hmm. I'm going to meet up with other, another group of people called the Terran Collective. Okay. Do you know them? I have, I have not heard of them. No. Aaron Brodeur, Dor Garbosh, and Tibet Sprague. Okay. Uh, who, because they all met at Burning Man, also go by uh, superhero names. I know one of them is Prometheus. I don't know the rest. Okay. Uh, they're a very interesting group of folks. They got some good stuff going on with, um, with Dalstack actually. Hmm. Uh, they're doing a lot of the, they're like a real kind of a really coherent product application development team, but oh, also with a, a big conceptual space that they're working in. So I'm also mm-hmm. gonna be hanging out with them, but it'd be awesome to actually be able to connect with you. When you say you live in San Francisco in the city. Yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, in Ashbury Heights. Yeah. Okay. Super easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. So we'll yeah. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to reach out to you digitally to to find out how we can do that. Well. Yeah, I would love that. Um, to tie the or to kind of try to take what you're saying and map it onto some of the ideas that I was um, that we began the conversation with with respect to uh, some of my intuitions with respect mm. to agent base emergence. Um, when I was studying a lot of this stuff, I was very deep into topological structures. 
and trying to understand topological structures as not just landscapes, but also potentially ways of thinking about the structure of information flow throughout complex systems. Okay. And so you're, you're kind of talking about this sphere through which there are these uh, dynamic feedback loops moving um, in countercurrents that are interacting with one another. Yep. In a way. Um, and I think that our, our thinking there aligns and, and parallels one another quite uh, almost in an eerie fashion. But I think that's, that's partly just because we're trying to we're trying our best to perceive reality and perhaps perceiving certain uh, patterns that, you know, the words don't exist, the patterns don't exist. So we're, we're grasping at the linguistic structure that we have and, you know, it's, it's within similar domains. So yep. are you familiar with the idea of, you know, like a Mobius strip, right? Yep. Do you know Klein bottle? The, the, yep. Okay. So I was looking at this, you know, these ideas through the lens of, at least the metaphor in my mind was something along the lines of a nested climb bottle in which the point at which it intersects with itself, you would insert yet another type of climb bottle information. You, you can kind of look at the, the top of it as the top of the agentic surface that makes contact with the environment. Yep. And then when the information, you can kind of picture the information flowing down one side of it into the nested recursion. But then, but then converging to points at some layer of depth at which it decides to travel back up the recursive surface yep. on the inside of that same topology. Yep. So now you have information flowing down the recursive topological structure on one side and up it on the other side. And it's a loop, but there's information flowing up and down and then there's a membrane, right? Which is the quote unquote surface. Yep. Well, then it's not too far from there to think that there might be some sort of information exchange or receptors between, you know, information moving up the loop um, from various depths, right? And I, I kind of look at when I talk about these different time frames, I would kind of map the different time frames of codified structures to the different levels of recursion of this nested climb bottle structure. Um, and so, uh, in the deepest version, so, certain, so some information would trigger uh, something that happens in your environment. Some information might flow all the way down to your deepest evolutionary structures and interact with something there. And only at that point would it codify and, and, and perhaps activate a neural structure that then flowed back up that system. But, but that's quite rare because most of the time it's like a sieve or like a Sierpinski gasket or something along those lines where most of the time it would, it would activate something far more recent. Um, and, and those loops, I'm thinking a lot about the, the concept to tie this to some extent back into Facebook and social media. Um, I'm thinking about the, the structures of, of communication and, and the way that we interact with information how does it impact our ability to exist at different levels of that recursion? And what is the implication of that? Like how it, are we creating structures that trap us at the surface of that structure and prevent us from existing within some of the deeper cultural or historical patterns of thought? Um, in a way I, I was kind of like, I don't know. I, I'm trying to stack too many. I'm trying to stack too many concepts right now. And it's, it's That's getting, a that's a serious stack, but let's, let's, well, why don't we grab, grab the last thing you said and pivot on that and yeah. just contextualize it in the, in the situation of Facebook. So we have a nice, simple articulation of Facebook. Um, I can hold the entire stack that you just articulated it at, at yeah. least the semantic level that you articulated it, not in depth for sure. Yeah. Um, but if we start back at the prosaic, and, uh, I think those two touch points might be good. So retell that story just from the point of view of Facebook. So just from the point of Facebook. And perhaps I could use this to lead into actually what I'm writing about, which is not directly related to this, but is, is somewhat related to it. Um, you'll have to forgive me to some extent because for many of these ideas, I just, I haven't articulated them um, anywhere but within my own mind. And can, so, I, can I introduce something to you? Mm -hmm. um, so, by the way, welcome to Deep Code. Um, <laughs> so the, it's called Rule Omega. Okay. Uh, Rule Omega is the, the only ethical and epistemological principle of deep code. Um, and what it 
articulates is what you just said. Um, and, but also the ethical corollary, which is if I am operating under rule Omega, then you recognize that I am the kind of being that is endeavoring to grasp really deep, difficult, distant, nuanced things. And by definition, when I'm expressing them to you, they're going to be very hard to understand. In fact, I haven't yet even come close to figuring out what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, in, I am absolutely acting in good faith to try to do this thing in collaboration with you. And you, by agreeing to rule Omega, are also operating in absolute good faith to try to listen and mm -hmm. to collaborate with me so that we are forming a shared consciousness to do this work that we are, in fact, both doing simultaneously. Uh, it's I love it. It's associated with the thing you said earlier, which is that we're trying to, we're trying to perceive reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ain't easy. And <laughs> we're very poorly equipped to do it. So Understatement yeah. of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is like, it's like Rula Mega is the ultimate mea culpa. You are fully forgiven from the beginning. So you're free and safe to try uh you know, do do your most acrobatic work and sort of i'll do my best to serve as a net um but of course we'll also be simultaneously doing that same thing so it's a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it's real, like real-time jazz acrobatics over a uh, over a pit <laughs> okay okay so i will step back and t to try to tell the facebook story and, and tie it into what i was discussing i think it makes sense to to discuss it through the lens of perhaps the intensification of, of information flows and what the intensification of flows through a system, you know, a network, right? In, 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 in information, in, in a network of, of actual agents, such as ourselves, um, information has flowed through us across the surface of, of humanity's um, mental landscape, so to speak, at different rates across time, right? So, you know, at, at one point, we didn't even have uh, linguistic symbols that could carry information between agents. And therefore, all of the actual um, information that we exchange with one another had to be actually embodied in our relationship structures. And I, I kind of allude to that to some extent in the, in the essay that you were reading. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, there's this, and I think you talk about this to some extent when you have these, you have innovation, you have moments in which the complexity of the environment and the system in question synchronize around a new modality of exchanging information that gives you a sort of positive feedback loop and you gain some territory with respect to the expressive capacity within you know, your network. And also, you gain a bit more control over the domain that may have once had a greater degree of control over you. Mm -hmm. right? you know, we, we actually start gripping the fabric of humanity or gra gripping the fabric of reality um, a little bit more. Um, we gain the capacity to impose our intent upon more and more complex, um, more and more complex environments mm -hmm. that once had, had that once almost exclusively exerted their intent or lack, you know, just exerted their, um, just exerted themselves upon us, whether intentionally or not. Um, so you can kind of look at this as a macro pattern of these, this continuous series of innovations from, you know, from, from language to actually the printed word to different modalities of, of actually increasing the rate of speed and the um, distance at which that written word could be uh, uh, transmitted, right? Yep. And so we, cre we keep creating these um, increasingly capable higher speed networks of um, infusing human minds in the network with larger and larger degrees of symbols that carry meaning um, and therefore any given moment of a particular individual's existence is going to be infused with an increasingly large amount of these symbols. And that's deeply related to this notion of, of sense-making um, in terms of we're at this moment where 
uh, I, I often think a lot about like, what are the limitations of the, the structural biology of the human mind in terms of, you know, the upper bound of, of making sense of um, a stream of symbols. Um, and then it becomes a question of, you know, what is your, what is your, and this, is, this ties into your self-sovereignty idea, like what is your sampling rate? What are the types of things that you target? How do you make sense? Oh, it went silent. Sorry, my phone, my phone was ringing. Got it. Um, how, how, do you, how do you actually, you know, what are your interpretive frameworks that you apply um, to the selection interpretation of this increasing rate of symbols? And you know, is there some point at which no interpretive framework may be sufficient for any one agent to have um, the ability to, uh, to navigate this system in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, I think perhaps to some extent, that's, that's the point at which um, collective intelligence becomes not merely useful, but perhaps the only mechanism of, uh, the, the, the only possible, the only possible technology or the only possible capacity that we could develop to allow us to thread the existential needle, right? Yeah. And so, and so that's kind of, I kind of look at that as a, you know, there's an accelerating nature to that, right? And so then the question becomes with respect to something like Facebook or social media, how, how much of that is, if you, if you use, if you use the, if you try to develop systems that intentionally leverage the human brain to lock people within systems that they are not well equipped to navigate or make sense within, what is that doing to their uh, what is that doing to their um, their ability to engage with the other parts of uh, contextual reality or, or or deep time or deep deep code perhaps um, that they may need to be able to even become a useful part of the collective intelligence? Right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, the short answer is um, it degrades. Yeah, uh, and there's. I actually wrote an, an, another essay about this about two months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I think called "What's the Problem with Social Media" or something like that. Mm. Where I actually explicate those ideas more deeply, and there's, there's actually, I think, five distinct characteristics of that phenomenon. So one, for example, I'm at, I think I'm doing it at one or two levels of abstraction, or uh, less abstraction than you are right now but for example the the problematic of the relationship between weak and strong social links mm -hmm. that there's an optimization so yeah so you've got a finite amount of attention and you've got a finite amount of adaptive capacity mm -hmm. uh, this seems to be just true it may not be but it seems to be yeah. um you're always we are wired to always be using our maximum uh, adaptive capacity in the and in, in the context of where it makes sense for us to point our attention and in the context of something like a social network like Facebook, what ends up happening is that we're living in a simulation that grabs a substantial amount of our attention mm -hmm. precisely because it plays on, very, very effectively plays on that gap between what seems to be good and what is actually good for us. Mm -hmm. um, and it does so in a way that turns our adaptive capacity to to optimize for um, complicated rather than complex environments. This is something that Joe Edelman's been writing about a lot. And for weak social signals and affinity relationships rather than strong social signals and coherence relationships. Okay. And this has to do with the thing you're talking about of surface to depth. Yes. That there is actually, apparently, as far as we can, I can tell, a way for human beings to become very, very adapted to surfing fast, quick, shallow affinity, mm -hmm. um, but almost by definition at the expense of the allocation of those finite resources to slower, deeper coherence. Yep. Um, and... I believe, I, I, well, 
I believe, and I believe I have a good reason to believe, but I cannot quite recall why. Mm -hmm. um, there is actually, that's not, that's not good. There's, there's, there's a way to demonstrate that, that the topology of that kind of collective intelligence mm -hmm. um, always fails. Mm -hmm. And in fact, always fails in an accelerating finite time, meaning mm -hmm. the more you progress towards that nodal point, the more rapid it actually collapses. Mm -hmm. I think it's isomorphic with the reason that complicated systems collapse. So it ends up being sort of a, a similar fundamental dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it's difficult. For, like it's, it's kind of unpacking the same fundamental conceptual scheme across three different um, material or physical instantiations. Um, yeah, it's got to be. So, Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, it's fine. Um, so let me, let me try something on for size here. It's, it's a metaphor that I, I used to, you know, more, maybe more of an intuition pump, but I used to try to navigate this idea myself. Um, and let me just maybe just frame it in the idea that I would posit that the issue may be that the, the way that the connective structure evolves disconnects us from all of our prior evolutionary knowledge in a way that makes the system fragile. Yeah. And so the way I, I kind of, I've, I've used this idea to conceptualize it to some extent is, and I, I imagine, I imagine the sum total of, of human knowledge, not just conscious explicit knowledge, but you know, even the, the knowledge that we have latent within us or just our, our historical systems or systems of record or artifactual history, that we may not have fully extracted all useful information from, but, but mm -hmm. it all exists layer upon layer. But I, I kind of look at it as uh, a sphere and all of that is this layered liquid. And the closer into the center of that liquid sphere you go, the viscosity increases and the, the buoyancy, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're push, you're, it takes, the further you go into the center, the more energy it takes to move further into the center, right? Yep. And so it's, it's hard enough. And so like, I kind of think of it like without any conscious cognitive effort, we'll float on the surface and, and bob there. And that's probably the point of, of you know, least, um, least. Sorry, my phone is just going crazy. I need to remember to disconnect it from all of the uh, in otherwise integrated systems next time I take a con conference call. Um, so, uh, surface floating least. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Cool. So, and in the state of in the state of non-exertion, you know, you're kind of at at this point. Um, you're at this point where you're bobbing on the surface, and that point is, you know, there's it's a kind of a minimal, perhaps minimal suffering. Um, in terms of just the amount of effort that you might have to put yourself through uh, to extract otherwise useful value from this structure that um, uh, from this structure that that otherwise resists our ability uh, to uh, to extract knowledge from it, and this kind of maps to Peterson's idea of of the archetype of chaos, right? Where it's like the deeper, it's kind of like the, the sphere of chaos. You could even look at it. Um, you could look at it at that, although he maps that idea to more of like the external domain of the unknown. But I think that it can also be applied to this, this domain of our own, our own unknown in common. In, involuted, in, involuted to the union and consciousness. And, and I sure. think you're going to, you'll, you'll get a closure on it. Okay. Okay. And then, but then the interesting part, and then none of that part is necessary, necessarily the most interesting part about this. The most interesting part about this is that, you know, we have to we have to dive. We have to develop structures in the same way that you would develop a structure to actually dive underneath the ocean. You know, you need to have a scuba tank, or you need to have a submarine. Um, you need to have these these mechanisms that allow you to withstand pressure and and not be pushed back up to the surface or or drown in the depths of this uh, this otherwise um, this otherwise volatile and host, you know, hostile environment to to our particular consciousness. And so it's like you then we created these structures of social media. Or, or our connectivity, not only are we buoyant at the top, we've also created a massive network that creates like a surface tension in a way. And maybe that's what I'm kind of, maybe that's the, the, the one takeaway from this whole metaphorical structure is that, you know, we have these different layers of, of communication that incentivize particular modes of interaction 
And to the extent that you are enmeshed in that surface tension, you're going to spend even less time diving under the depths of this, this knowledge, uh, this kind of like the sphere of knowledge and actually um, spending the energy to take those deep dives and stay in those deeper layers. Because, you know, this is the idea we have these, this concept of, of FOMO that's now very much in the zeitgeist. And I think this, we're kind of trying to articulate this notion of an extreme surface tension to one another because we have extreme visibility into one another's lives, extreme visibility into all of the other processes that are going on at that behavioral surface. And that is going to pull us away from the types of exploration of the, the invisible, the exploration of, of the historical, the, expo- you know, the exploration of the textual. Uh, it creates this gravitational pull away from it or surface tension. Like, I don't know. Like I said, this is, this is all just in my head now. So I need to articulate it before I can actually spell it out in a way that's compelling, I think. But with that raw material, I'll, I'll toss it off to you. Nice. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was terrible. Would, would, you, would, you, would you like to be the, the bass player? If, yeah, that felt like bass to me. I, I was just <laughs> listening to, to jazz. So we just handed it off to, uh, to Mingus to play a little bass solo. Um, all right, so one of, the, one of the terms that you used is actually a term that I wanted to bring into the conversation, which was viscosity. So mm-hmm. I'm going to play with viscosity for a little bit in this metaphor. Um, so we have a, 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 a feedback re- or a relationship between the surface and the depth in this sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a relationship that has... The, the, the deeper you go, the higher the viscosity. This means two things. One is the more energy that is necessary to be able to cause it to move. Yep. And the, the more leverage it has on causing movement in the other opposite direction. Yes. Right? So it's like a, the, 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 uh, the atmosphere of, of Jupiter. Yeah. You know, the, as, the, as Jupiter rotates the core yeah i guess the deep the deeper you go the more subject you would be to its inertial forces that's right and the more um the slower and more intense the execution the 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 execution of energy is to generate i'm going to just say change i can't go any further than that yeah. Um, all right. So that's one piece. And but so I think that kind of also speaks to the idea of, of the, the deep code, um, the notion of deep code, because deep code may be, you know, the energy required to actually change that structural, uh, you know, code of, of our culture requires this, this massive exertion to, to yield even the smallest of results. But because it underlies every other structure, those small changes may be enough. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and well, okay. So let's just slide to that pretty quickly. Um, so let me tell you what, 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 what we're, what we're doing. Um, I could probably give it to you in its raw form, but let me give it to you in a, in a slightly simpler form and then come back. Um, there's a guy named Tom Sheen. Tom is uh, working was the, was the, one of the first guys, I think the, the founder of Google X, and then he left and he is working on trying to do very, kind of practical things in large scale system dynamics. Specifically, he grasped the problem of carbon remediation, right? So he looked at the whole system and said, oh shit, where are the places where we're sort of in the most trouble in the soonest time frame and the most distant from any viable solution? And he found two places. One was uh, uh, coral reefs and the other one was um, carbon remediation. So the proposition is that we're already so far out over our skis on carbon that even if we cut emissions to zero, it wouldn't solve anything. We have to actually get extremely good at um, pulling it out of the atmosphere and, yeah, and, and sequestering it. Um, so then, and this is, this is the key point, he then ran a uh, sort of a design spec on what, is a, what does a viable solution even look like mm-hmm. um, and what are the parameters. And so what he was able to, to, to discover or identify was that we had to get to the point where we were pulling something like 10 gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere on an annual basis 
by 2025 to have any, uh, to, to be a viable solution, which is to say that if we didn't get that amount in that time frame or sooner, then the feedback loops of, of the, de the destabilization of the larger system start to get out of control pretty quickly. Like it okay. might be plus or minus two or three years, but it's sort of a, a nice envelope. Yeah. Which is the um, type of conversation that we really can't meaningfully have in, in, the, in the public consciousness in, in this climate in terms of, you know, the, the sensitive dependence on those thresholds and, and what that actually means or might look like if it does tend, you know, to, to kind of start, start kind of falling into that phase shift, you know? Yep. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a sort of a, a meaningful problem. And, 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 and well, actually, oddly enough, so we'll, we'll get there in a second. So, yeah. so the idea is that the, once you can characterize correctly characterize what a viable solution must look like. And that's one characteristic. Well, I guess it's three. Um, others have, have to do with the fact that it, can't, it must also not generate unanticipated consequences in other domains, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. do us any good to do carbon remediation in a fashion that, for example, let's say accelerates, collapse the coral reefs. You know? So it mm -hmm. has to be, from a biomimicry perspective, a do-no-harm solution that also hits this design criteria. Mm -hmm. Once the design criteria are put in place, then you can begin the process of actually trying to figure out how to construct a solution and see if there's anything within the, the, the viable design space that actually works. Uh, as it turns out, he actually found one, uh, and it's, that's nice. Uh, and so he's in the process right now of, of, of building it and making it and trying to instantiate it. The point is that Deep Code tried to do, is endeavoring to do that kind of thing at the most fundamental level. All right, so if you take a look at the scope of the of the total problem, can we articulate the total problem um, with enough clarity that we can then use it to define the design space of any necessary and sufficient solution? Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the criteria of the feedback loop between any possible set of rivalrous games in the context of any exponentially accelerating technological capacity turns out to be one of the primary parameters. In fact, yeah. it may be the only one that matters because everything else, if you solve for that, everything else actually you kind of get for free as far as we can tell. And the binding strength or the, the uh, resilience to change that is necessary to resolve that requires a level of structural depth that is extraordinary meaning you actually have to go down to things that may in fact just flat out be invariant under all transforms mm -hmm. uh, I think of this as oh oh fun okay so here's a different concept um, this notion of viscosity is perfect because what it allows you to do is also use the notion of temperature um, and you can use that to then think of intensity so if I have a and you talked about this earlier so when I innovate a new capacity to deploy intensity what I what I'm able to do is relate to things that I used to have to conceive of as solid mm -hmm. as actually now being liquid. I can yep. melt stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the problematic is that if you're building a self-sovereign structure on structures that are meltable, then you actually end up being in deep trouble. Yep. Uh, so you have to find a way to find something that is actually will show up as solid under infinite agency. Yeah. So I think uh, to some extent, then the metaphor becomes, you know, the creation of game theoretic metamaterial. All right. Keep going with that. So in terms of the idea that, you know, there are, we have these, we have these low resolution abstractions when it comes to the idea of temperature and matter or the types of matter and, and the behavior of the, the simple types of matter that we, uh, that, you know, the, the layman would know about in terms of, you know, you have your solids, your liquids, your gases, uh, your plasmas, if you, you know, perhaps remember a little bit more about the high school textbook. Um, but most people don't know that we're actually in the process of discovering what is, you know, what are known to be hundreds or thousands of different types of matter, right? Um, new states of matter. Uh, and not only are we discovering new states of matter that are these exotic states of matter, but we're also starting to, leverage what we're learning about those states to you know, intentionally engineer uh, materials that have properties that would not otherwise be found in the types of uh, configurations of matter that might naturally settle within the physical environment. 
And so in terms of our biological environment and the game theoretic model, one might look at those as you know, also potentially categorized by uh, a smaller subset of low resolution um, uh, game theoretical categories or rule-based categories. I think that that might map towards something like, you know, Stephen Wolfram's mapping of uh, a new kind of science and like when he kind of draws like, what is it, three or four uh, families of these types of agentic systems uh, just from basic rule sets. But that being said, we obviously know that within complex systems, there are all sorts of other attractor states. There are all sorts of other ways that um, you can stabilize um, local complexity. And so what we don't necessarily know as much about is, is how to, again, so, so that would map to the idea of discovering new forms. Many other exotic forms of matter would be actually mapping many other uh, stable attractors of, of behavioral space, right? But then what we're trying to learn is the same idea of creating the metamaterials of uh, attractors in terms of intentionally taking the reins of creating stable complexity uh, with new properties that might yeah. not be naturally settled otherwise. Right. Well, that makes sense. Right. Perfect. Yeah. So hold that. Now do this thing where you do a drill down. So imagine that your, uh, you, your ability to melt is increasing in intensity. So mm -hmm. you, pow you power through uh, chemistry. And you're mm -hmm. now operating at the level of physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you power through physics. Now you're operating at the level of that thing which gives rise to physics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, of which mathematics is a piece. Mm -hmm. um, or actually it's the generator function from which mathematics comes, as it turns out. Both mathematics and physics are actually peers. Mm -hmm. And there's a generator function that lies be below both of them. Yep. Topology is the... Is the is, is closer. You can actually mm -hmm. do topology in both mathematics and physics. Mm -hmm. So now we're at the level of topology. Um, you can actually go lower than that uh, two levels, and that's as far as it appears that you actually can go. Um, what would you What would you characterize as two levels deeper than topology? Just so that we're. Uh, I it, 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 we could go there, but that requires that we actually do that work. Um, okay. The, sure. just, the only thing I can do is to say that there's a a, a self-reifying, self-generating structure. Mm -hmm. That language right there, when I, you know, I paused before structure, the word structure is a pointer, not an actual object. Um, the, the, is this, you know, the, the, the metaphysical Ouroboros. Yes, that, that's right. It's that, it, here's, here's the, so we can do this. You get topology. <laughs> Uh, below topology, you're now going to be dealing with the partition between ontology and epistemology. As it turns out, there's six distinct things that lay at that, at that partition. Ethics, aesthetics, ontology, uh, epistemology. I can't remember the other two right now. Okay. Then there's one layer below that, which is the metaphysical Ouroboros. Yeah. The, the, form, the place from which ontology and epistemology collapse into a singularity, but nonetheless actually has a dynamis associated with it yeah right? so it's actually the location from which structure being and dynamics is omnipresent in a unity sure okay just wrote a short, i just wrote a short poem about this last night actually it's funny no oddly, oddly enough <laughs> <laughs> i'll send it over to you after the conversation <laughs> nice well i'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to the guy who actually did that primary work okay. uh, uh kind of the the lowest point in deep code. Uh, ah, that, okay, that's yeah. going to be a, oh, that's going to be awesome. Um, yeah. And he'll be very happy. He don't, he only has like five people he can talk to. So having people he can talk to is one of the biggest gifts that we give him. Um, yeah. So but the point is this. I mean, it truly is to be able to communicate about these types of ideas and, and actually share. Oh, it, which, um, oh God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, he may actually start crying by the way. Uh, and that's great. It's beautiful. Um, so, so the point is that if you're going to be building anything in an environment that has that level of potential intensity, uh, if you don't take care to uh, identify in very, we talk with metamaterials, like if you're trying to actually build metamaterials, um, you're going to be having, you're going to be having to operate at the level of topology at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that in the, in the, you know, under exponential, we get past topology actually pretty quickly. 
and maybe like 20, 45. So we really have to actually go all the way down. Now, the beautiful part is that it appears to be the case that when you get all the way down to the metaphysical Ouroboros, the question of intensity breaks down. That You're actually now at a level below concepts like uh, force and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, change. Mm-hmm. And so by definition, force and change no longer have any ability to do anything. In fact, you're actually below the level of do. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you're in an invariant that is a place from which you can then construct higher order um, structures that mm-hmm. you can have confidence will be able to parameterize all of the higher order, I guess, behaviors or dynamics yeah. without falling out of the ability to continue to be. So in, in, a, in a simulationist conception, is that something like the, the information theoretic bedrock then from which all emerges? Yeah. From a simulation perspective, that would be it. Yeah. And so and the interesting question then becomes, you know, how do we, you know, other than, other than conceptually, if it's beyond the domain of empirical observation, um, it becomes rather different. It becomes rather difficult to, to develop those types of maps and develop an understanding of you know, if it's beyond dynamics, if it's just an encoding and it's a non empirically identifiable encoding, you know, we're, we're working with reverberations only at these higher levels, right? The, 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 pat, the, the invariant, the, in, the emergent invariant patterns of the reverberations and trying so to work backwards. Let me, let me, uh, let me do this. We, we can actually get a little, this is actually a helpful tool. Empirical is actually a higher level concept yep. that we can, there's actually something that is more basic than empirical that mm-hmm. we can actually use. So we're, what we actually, what we actually end up doing is we, so we recognize that empirical ends up being first person, mm-hmm. right? So it's the, the binding at first person, which is differentiated from the binding at third person. Mm-hmm. And by the way, which is differentiated from the binding at that thing, which is both and neither first and third person. And yep. it turns out you now have closure. Those are, that's, that's the lowest level basis at which you can have. So you can do and must so do. Is, is the binding between first and third person or the, the, the state of uh, ambiguity between first and third person that is that closure or that is that, that ability to feed back upon itself? Is that the, the coherence binding? Is that where you're going there? Or is that what you're... Is that, it is, actually. Okay. That is exactly where it is. Um, and so, uh, I mean, fortunately... We, we can do that. So, so the, the thing that you're looking for under the heading of empiricism, you can still look for under the heading of first person. Uh, there's actually a more fundamental way of articulating that. First person is just a useful metaphor. You can get lost if you actually stick in that metaphor. You find yourself becoming a Buddhist, um, <laughs> yeah. which, isn't, which isn't bad. It's useful, but no. it's not, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have everything we need right now. Um, and you, you can get lost there. But the idea is that if you... Uh, if you recognize the necessity of having a simultaneity or a trimultaneity of what we can call first person and third person and the binding between first and third person, it's important to recognize that it's an and. That third isn't enough by itself. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to have all three simultaneously. Then you have the checksum that science has been able to get via what we call the combination between math and empiricism. Mm -hmm. So it's just a a more basic and foundational expression of the deep insight that gave rise to the scientific method. Okay. Whew, that was heavy. Um, <laughs> it's fun. Have you ever done like, uh, I assume you've done some variation. I'm going to go juggling. Um, metaphorical juggling? No, no, actual physical juggling. Um, I have, I haven't, you know, I, I've gotten to a very, very basic level of being able to do it, but not having practice it regularly. It's something that I can't just pick up. Uh, tightrope walking. Uh, I love the tightrope walking metaphor. Uh, so the, the, 
you may have some example of, of this. In Slack, your I've slacklined a bit. Slacklined. Okay. So the, the experience is just a, a circumstance like that where you are very much walking on something where you are at the limits of your ability to, to be there, Yep. but you're endeavoring to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any number of embodied experiences are of that sort. Mm -hmm. I, that's how I just felt. Like I was actually like, uh, <laughs> teetering on the edge, but trying to hold it in place and getting to the other side and like touching the tree. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, right? I mean, it, it is that I think it's, it's expressed quite clearly. And people like Peterson talk about this explicitly as well in terms of you know, this is why we watch sports. This is why we watch, you know, uh, the, this is, this is why we watch, uh, you know, those who have practiced or those who have gone to the limits of, of our known capacities uh, act out the limits of their own capacities for all yeah. others to you know, appreciate or potentially try to emulate. Um, it's, it is a beautiful thing. It, it's, it's, it's quite powerful. Um, oh, speaking of type, sorry. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an interrupt. I'm going to hand the ball back to you to finish what you were just saying, but I'd mm -hmm. like to introduce before we. Uh, what is your hard stop, by the way? Do you have a? Probably 30 minutes. Okay. Um, I got to get to something at noon and I don't want to be pre pressing it too hard. Sure. Um, I'd like to loop into pragmatics. Uh, like what exactly tactically or materially are you up to and, or what would be the most meaningful way for us to, um, develop this relationship? Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, I want to put that in on the stack tight ropes. Okay. Yeah. The, the tight ropes concept is something that's, it's, it's a little bit, I've been thinking about it through the lens of the evolutionary metaphor of what we are, you know, the schism between the perception of stability and the reality of extreme contingency, if that makes sense. So, you know, in our, in our, in our everyday life, we are, I, I kind of like to look at it as evolution and the processes that have given rise to us have given us this powerful gyroscope that we carry with us as we walk upon this tightrope. And we don't realize that we're on the tightrope above a 10,000 foot chasm because mm. the gyroscope is so finely tuned. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it doesn't take much in terms of, you know, if you're willing to go there, and this is one reason why I think people have such profound experiences with psychedelics, um, because that is one way of observing just how easily the system can be perturbed and the extreme potential disorientation that entails from even slight distortions of that gyroscopic stabilization. And so it's almost kind of like, you know, you'll have these moments. And the reason I kind of like to think about that through that individual lens, because I also think society is starting to have these moments where we're on the tightrope. We don't realize we're on the tightrope, but the gyroscope is starting to glitch out right? And it glitches out and it stops working momentarily. And we get this sense of, you know, uh, extreme dizziness or, or fear or fear of heights in terms of like starting to realize just how deep the chasm beneath us is if the gyroscope were to begin malfunctioning in a way that is more chaotic than it already um, is, is trending towards. And, you know, I, think I kind of look at like Trump like that. Trump is this glitch in the gyroscopic stabilization mechanism. Yeah. And it's giving some people extreme panic reactions to the realization of just how fragile a system, um, just how fra so, so just how fragile reality can become if certain uh, if certain assumptions are violated repeatedly and we push over one of those those thresholds like in the same kind of way when, when we're talking about the complex system of the climate environments like you know you start bumping up against these thresholds and even though all behavior before that was was relatively linear and mapped pretty well to human intuition and you know, we could tell this linear story of history when you start bumping up against a phase transition or, or a potential bifurcation point things stop making sense in any type of linear uh, narrative and, you know, when that happens, you know, then the bifurcation point is kind of like the, uh, the left or right looking down over the, over the, over the wire, 10,000 feet down, you know, and like, you don't want to necessarily um, fall off on either side. And the question becomes, how do you maintain the illusion of, of that narrative or, or even the narrative? How do you, how do you maintain linearity or at least some sort of coherence? 
Um, uh, the word so, some sort of coherence, and in this case, I'm going to put sovereignty back into the into the vocabulary. It's how do you maintain sovereignty? Okay. Um, so there's a all couple. Right. Of, there's like I think three distinct things here that are all separate and interesting. Um, so the one is the gyroscope, um, and what I'm going to talk about that I'm going to talk about that, that using the language you used or we used earlier in terms of this. Uh, uh, unconscious intelligence uh, or stack. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and, and walking on a, a tightrope is perfect. I mean, think about it. Uh, a one-year-old can't walk on a floor. Mm -hmm. and that's the beginning of the stack is the actual building of the capacity to walk balance, awareness, perception, kin kinesthetics. Um, by the time you get to the point where you're capable of walking on a tightrope, all of that shit is being run in the unconscious, meaning it's being run in a, a domain of intelligence that you don't have to have any conscious control over at all. So you end up having this real significant, gigantic intelligence that is acting as an unconscious gyroscope that your conscious volition and perception, which is itself minuscule, um, relies on. Mm -hmm. all right? Now, there's another aspect to the degree to which that is entirely unconscious and your consciousness becomes aware of the vastness of that for which it is in fact responsible. If it forgets that it's not responsible, then it gets terrified. <laughs> and so this is, this is the, you look when you're rock climbing and you look down or you're mm -hmm. walking on the tightrope and you suddenly become aware of the fact you're walking on the tightrope. Mm -hmm. Consciousness takes itself as taking responsibility for the vastness of the thing it's trying to do i.e. losing track of the fact that it is just the tiniest trim tab on top of a, by definition, equivalently vast capacity, otherwise mm -hmm. you wouldn't be even in this position of tightrope walking, mm -hmm. then it falls into immediate overwhelm. Now, this mm -hmm. is a serious fucking problem because if it falls into overwhelm, then the third characteristic arises, which is the well-functioning of this stack, of this gyroscope, is itself very delicate. And so mm -hmm. if and as consciousness falls into some form of overwhelm, we can do this very neurologically. If you get scared, um, then actually the neurological is very, very easy, right? If, you're, if your prefrontal cortex begins the process of telling a story that indicates that the situation you're dealing with is mythopoetically overwhelming, then paradoxically, your adrenal system will actually respond to that story as if it's a real phenomenon and mm -hmm. kick your brain into, adre into adrenal and amygdala hijack, which actually restrict blood flow and neurological override out of the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. radically collapsing your actual capacity to, well, your actual capacity, full stop. Mm -hmm. um, and so you end up with this really interesting problem that, uh, and this I think is the reason why I've actually been so interested in the stuff that, say, Jordan Peterson is doing, or at least the, the space that he is indicating is a place to look at. Yep. Um, which is, I think, a place that I spent a lot of, you know, my, I wrote the, my essay on sovereignty is about this primarily. Uh, and this is, is how our, metaf our, our metaphorical tightrope walker operates. Um, yeah, you are suspended over an enormous uh, abyss. Mm -hmm. And you can only do what you can do. And there's a very large amount of what you might do that will reduce your ability to do what you can do. So maybe we should, maybe we should connect the dot because right? I think there's a lot of structural parallels between the process you just outlined of, of looking down without the realization that the capacity to bring yourself to the point at which you even had the ability to look down in the first place um, implies more irrelevance than relevance with respect to that perception of, um, you know, that acute perception of anxiety or fear in that moment. Right. And I think that may be also precisely what we're talking about or what I was trying to communicate with respect to the emerging disconnect mm. in the mode of being on social media. Yeah, I think that's dead right but just at the, at the collective scale of the collective organism acting in that way. That's really neat. So the implication would be that um, 
<clears throat> huh. That's really interesting. I think that's actually awesomely right. So, so here's the way it's, it's feeling to me. Using tightrope walking as the metaphor. There's a way of having an, an integrated, I'm going to say consciousness, that allows you to be aware of, in the right way, the modalities of intelligence that are, in fact, adequate to and responsible for things like walking. Okay? But without doing this state shift where you're pulling responsibility and agency for that capacity out of those domains and into some other domain for which that isn't possible. Right? So the walking along the tightrope, you suddenly try to take responsibility for controlling your balance, running it in consciousness, which is a fucking terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're, if you're really, really self-aware, like you could do it right now. Like a, I can, you can stand on one foot and you can notice that, yeah, shit's going on. Like I'm standing on one foot, holding the laptop in one hand and balancing. If I'm just like listening very closely, I can be aware of the fact that there's actually an intelligence that's taking care of that. Mm -hmm. I can notice it. The more I try to pay attention to where my balance is, the less balance I have. It's harder mm -hmm. because I'm somehow I'm changing the sovereignty flow and putting the sort of the shape of that intelligence out of sphere. Yeah. But I can still notice it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where it is, right? But here's the key thing. All right, so given that metaphor, <clears throat> that sphere of meta-sovereignty that we've been talking about, these layers of viscosity all the way mm -hmm. down to the deep code, there is a mode of intelligence that is operating at that level already. Our mm -hmm. job is to actually be able to be present to a kind of being aware that allows us to give that intelligence the space and integration that it needs to surface and do the work that it needs to do. Mm -hmm. Meaning we cannot operate at the level of consciousness and intelligence that we use at the surface mm -hmm. and try to do the work at the base. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, I think it's, go ahead. Just to extend your, your metaphor in terms of the, the balancing metaphor um, and the, the trying to tune into that. Um, so I think the way that I kind of look at this as well, going all the way back to the, the kind of recursive topological stack, there's this, all these processes, dynamic processes going on deep within the stack and they're sending signals up the stack that are often um, in no way listened to by the conscious mind. And especially not, uh, they're, 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 not only are they not necessarily listened to or tapped into consciously, um, but what you're getting at is that if you do try to listen to them and then take control without having developed an ear for them, perhaps, um, the interaction can be quite dizzying, literally. Yep. Um, and it, it's kind of I don't, those who have those who have attempted yoga for the first time might be familiar with these types of uh, these moments where you put yourself in a position where you are now forced to realize that the natural modes of balance uh, that that control habituated processes are operating beyond their limitations mm -hmm. and therefore your conscious mind engages to try to correct. Yet, if you have not developed the grammatical capacity to interact with those structures, uh, those emergent structures and, and, and parameterize them with the appropriately subtle touch to exert appropriately subtle top down parameterization, you're going to fall and, and becoming, you know, Rehabituating that behavior becomes a process of, of actually developing that grammatical capacity. Yep. Um, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, that made a lot of sense. That was a, a very different set of words that I would have used, but I get it. That was very well done. Yeah, that's neat. That's actually quite inspiring. That um, I feel like I have a much better handle on what's happening. It's really interesting. So this will. I think this will actually end up generally showing up as spiritual to most people. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the, the embodied reality of collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really interesting concept. I think that's I, a, we were, I think we're actually like ironically on Twitter. Uh, and this is, I mean, it's meta ironic to even mention Twitter right now. Um, but 
you know, uh, Cernovich, the kind of con con conservative um, yep. voice who, you know, take him for what you will. But he's recently, uh, I think, struck a, a chord of panic with his followers because he's begun speaking in otherwise uh, spiritual language or talking about things like energies or talking about these types of uh, these shifts in the energy of consciousness. Mm. And he's speaking to a demographic who um, has very little, uh, likely has very little cultural immersion in, in those types of um, grammars. And he's getting a lot of friction for that. But I think that, that was just, it was a recent perception that I had that maps very well to what you're saying, because I think some people are, are starting to perceive these patterns of coherence or these shifts in the collective intelligence. And the only language um, available to them is the spiritual language. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be really interesting. I actually think it's kind of neat. I like it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, I'm intrigued. I'm actually going to take an eye on, I, uh, watch him and see if there's, see what you're talking about. Cause that also sounds fascinating. It doesn't, it, you're, you're articulating it is novel to me. I didn't, wasn't aware of it, but it, it doesn't surprise me. Yep. Um, because in, in just the same way that, you know, you and I are noticing that we have come to very similar perceptions um independently mm -hmm. as far as we can tell um <laughs> as independent as it gets <laughs> as independent as it gets um and of course it's, it's, it's obvious why that would be the case because reality happens to be reality which is awesome mm -hmm. and so if Sorovich or any agent any human or any sentient uh endeavors to perceive reality and becomes capable of doing so which is to say just constructs within themselves a in integrated intelligence with this ability to perceive these subtle signals from the unconscious, which also could be perceived as, say, their body, <clears throat> they're going to perceive reality, and it's going to be the same reality. That's actually like the most optimistic fact. Mm -hmm. um, so the unavoidable the optimism. <laughs> It is an unavoidable optimism. Yeah. Can't get any better than that. Yeah, it's funny. Like the, you can articulate the, the both the, the the problematic and the solution can actually be done pretty simply. Uh, I can't quite say it yet in a way that can be shared simply, but it's you know not that hard. It's it's very similar to this notion, this metaphor of the tightrope walker or the metaphor of the addict that you use, you use in your uh, mm. um, passage. It's like maybe three failure conditions. Mm. Um, Identify the failure conditions, remove the failure conditions, and then you're fine. Like, it's okay. The process of creating the map to discover the simplicity happens to be quite complex. Yeah, <laughs> it happens to be quite complex, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So we, we have, just to be respectful of your time, we have about 13 minutes left. So I know you, you may have wanted to go in, in a particular direction to wrap things up, per se. Yeah, is there is a you know what, what's the stuff that is um, well here's here's something that I've been I've been working on myself. Uh, what are what are things that you think might be able to help you flow more smoothly, um, either by getting them out of the way, or by bringing them into being. Mm -hmm. Whew. Uh, a lot of that depends on the level of resolution. Um, I think. In my own personal life, I'm working on articulating the body of thoughts that have only existed within my own mind um, in a way that is uh, in a way that that can begin to create the archetypal or, or or imagistic language that act as beacons um, to attract like-minded individuals uh, in a manner that facilitates more conversation uh, that gives rise itself to higher resolution images. And, and, you know, I kind of look at it as like this, this process of pointillism in which I'm trying to create the, you know, minimally viable uh, or a pointillist image of minimal viable interest to those with whom I would resonate. Yep. On these topics. And then together we can start adding more points. I've been calling that gen generative bat signaling. Yeah. 
Precisely. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's part of what I'm doing. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm writing in the way that I'm writing and, and, and starting to try to make some videos um, about these topics. So that's just at the personal development level and trying to build the uh, kind of trying to build the collective intelligence in my own personal life and, and identify uh, and integrate into those networks within the world um, to because we are you know, even if we are capable individuals, we are but individuals. And so plugging into those networks uh, is a highly positive sum game that I, I would like to play yeah. um, to the extent I'm capable. And so that's part of what I'm working on. Um, another part of what I'm working on um, is trying to take a lot of these ideas and map them onto a learning system, actually like create a mathematical framework with respect to the way that I envision modeling these dynamics topologically from an agent-based perspective. Um, I think if, if a tool like that could be created, um, I mean, that is, it's kind of like this, this experimental map, right? Like wh what is this experimental map of, 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 of the game theoretic reality in which we exist? Um, how can we potentially start developing tools that allow us to begin weaving these meta materials um, with, with tools other than just words? Because to some extent, our words are only so capable of expressing the nuanced dynamics of what happens at the edges of these systems. So yep. I'm, I'm interested in, in developing those types of models and working with anybody who's interested in that. Great. And then above that, with respect to the paper that, that you've been reading on the development of human value systems, I am fascinated by the types of um, increased grammatical capacities uh, opened to humanity by uh, distributed systems of value representation and transaction that allow us to coordinate our trust and our interactions game theoretically in ways that are more sustainable and positive sum. So I think I kind of, I look at this emerging, this emerging space of, of cryptocurrency or what presents itself first as cryptocurrency um, as the entree to a world of, um, you know, stable social meta materials of value so yep uh, and so i've been thinking a lot about how to um, weave those pieces together with the notion of a uh, a collective so to speak um, of, of those who are interested in creating technologies um, or services that would coherently grow within the world uh and a kind of like a value generation engine is is one way of thinking about it um bound with a coherent substructure of trying to understand and map out and distribute the value that flows into it so perhaps i'm speaking in overly general terms now but i'm trying to just kind of get this in in the last few minutes but you know i look at a lot of the the negative dynamics in terms of our current economic structures as emerging from the capital flows into the systems and the way that the capital flows into systems shift incentive structures. So the particular like, um, you know, kind of flowing down a hill from high concentrations of capital to low concentrations of capital and then creating incentive structures largely predicated upon that is highly efficient in, in many ways, but it also has its limitations. And so we're starting to experiment with now emergent, collectively intelligent ways of allocating capital and, and organizing creation uh, in ways that, um, that perhaps explore more effectively the value landscape of humanity. That being said, they have their own attendant shortcomings. And you know, the ICO, the first ICO wave was a demonstration of that. And, and so I'm very interested in exploring this space in terms of how mm. to negotiate that boundary of, of allowing for effective structures of emergent um, cooperation, uh, capital allocation, cooperation, and, and minimizing um, unnecessary competition, but maintaining healthy competition, right? Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm working with some, you know, a few people to try to figure out what that would look like and, and how that would take, how that would take form in terms of an actual platform. I have some ideas that I've been mapping out, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't built it yet. 
So there's, um, so good. So there's a shift to pragmatics. Um, I actually don't want to overwhelm, so I'm just going to, I'm going to surface these and reserve them for a later, later date. But there's a, a group that I'm working with that is called the Good Money Project mm-hmm. that is, how do I put this right? They have a, a nice high capacity for operational excellence and good intent and at least the ability to, to perceive the value of more sophisticated approaches. Mm-hmm. All right. So they have asked for deep code help in designing a, it's actually kind of very simple. Their intent is to try to figure out how to actually create a uh, intrinsically stable cryptocurrency, right? Okay. Nice, desirable, simple thing. Mm-hmm. They're aware of the fact that that is, most interesting in the concept context of it being a potential strategic entree into a more sophisticated multivariate not necessarily metricized field of currencies and i'm using mm-hmm. the word currency there to mean um symbolic structures for modulating yep. uh, flows in, in the way that you use currency in your uh, santa fe talk Exactly. Yeah. So they don't get to the point where they can actually listen to the Santa Fe talk and know what I'm talking about, but they can get to the point where they can know the fact that that is something that's worth paying attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as a consequence, kind of, I interact with them at that, at that interface layer where I endeavor to provide them something that they actually feel is, they can sense is valuable, which is to say, here's how you actually design a metastable cryptocurrency that will work. And here's strategic approaches that will cause it to disseminate out into the global environment with maximum integrity and velocity. And by the way, if by virtue of doing this, you'll give me permission to load a couple more things on it that are my own private stuff that you probably won't understand or value, but you're just going to kind of give to me. Here's sure. some stuff to build to the API. And then when we get there, we'll, we'll, we'll add that. So that's an example. Yeah. There's another team that is building, it, it, it's still in the crypto space. Um, they have partnered up with a group that builds the largest scale uh, what the hell is it called? High speed trading trading system in legacy finance. Oh wow! To, to build something like that in crypto. All right, so this group has made it. There's you know mm. three three billionaires who built this system. They left it. They're now entirely ego driven to try to build something that is yeah. super fun and cool in crypto. The team that I'm talking about was had already has already built kind of an AI infrastructure for doing that, and it's really a very interesting and sophisticated uh, adaptive AI infrastructure with the intent of bridging exactly what you were just talking about. So it's Mm -hmm. uh, 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 collective intelligence resource allocation. That's that's Mm -hmm. where they're trying to get to. But this is part of the strategic vector. So I'm also working with them and helping them both strategically make sure that they're not making mistakes in terms of how they're setting themselves up and partnering, but also recognizing that the, the language that I use here is that we've got a game A, game B transition. We have to be able to re- build stuff that operates in and with the game A flows, but nonetheless doesn't uh, become incapable of delivering on the game B values. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another uh, a group. There's a, 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 a series of potential folks in the Bay Area who have, I've interacted with it kind of like the level we're interacting, that they've also been engaging in some kind of bat signaling, generative bat signaling effort that... Mm-hmm. I think what I'll probably want to do is maybe get you into a conversation with the deep code folks here. If I can use your, send them the link to your medium post as an entree, that would be perfect. Yeah, so of course. They can say, oh, here, I, they can map it. And also when I'm up in San Francisco, maybe just invite you to be part of the conversation with the Terran Collective. Just, I think there might be some fun synergy there and yeah. that would just be. I would a, love a that. Synergy. Yeah. I would love that. And then we can, we can go from there. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that can come down the road. Mm-hmm. Oh, it turns out that uh, the guy, the, the guy has. The, the metaphysics work also happens to be probably the most skilled software engineer alive or in the top five. 
And so he told me yesterday that he, he has now reached the point where he must teach me how to code to continue to be able to communicate with me. So <laughs> I'm now going to be entering into a Padawan ship of extending my coding capabilities from like maybe level two to level five. Ah, it's wonderful. Getting, getting into the weeds of the complexity is something that gives you just such a visceral appreciation for, uh, you know, for, for the, the delicate nuances of, of this, uh, the delicate nuances of the downstream effects of programming. I saw just to, I guess we have one minute. Uh, I saw there's an artist who took the, um, the memory buffers in like a super Nintendo system or for, for games, for the game card, yep. basically um, mapped them over a particular uh, window of, of playing this game and basically took each memory buffer and graphed it. And you can actually see effectively programmer fingerprints Right? Oh. Different programmers have these different characteristics in terms of how their intentional code is uh, you know, manifest itself in a generative relationship with a player, and there are still these attractors. So it's kind of like cognitive attractors that they've embedded in their code that wow. play, play out as patterns over the memory buffers. And he sells these things as art, and you can get him to do any uh, any Super Nintendo game, <laughs> which is kind that of that is. That is fantastic. That is yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Oh, man. Anyhow, <laughs> so I think we have plenty of fodder for another conversation. Well, um, sorry, you just blew my mind because you, you could do the same thing for Nietzsche. Yes, yes. Wow. Oh, I mean, obviously anybody, but that's the example that pops in my head. Holy cow, that's killer. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Wow. My brain is jelly. I'll have to let it uh, anneal. But <laughs> safe, safe travels, and I really look forward to speaking more and, and kind of pursuing all of these various paths. Yeah. All right, man. Thank you. Adios. Have a, have a wonderful day. Bye. Yeah.